there are any questions that you'd like to ask, today's session really is information about the scheme, but an opportunity really to answer any questions that you might have. Um, we've got some fantastic speakers, uh, so do post those questions in the chat. Uh, we will try and answer as many of them as we possibly can. OK, so just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Andrew Davidson. I'm the GMTS Senior Manager for Attraction and Recruitment. Uh, my role and the role of my team really is, is responsible for sharing information about the scheme, running the career sessions at universities, these webinars, and then you know managing the application assessment selection process, and then all the way through the onboarding process right up until hopefully you start with us uh, next September. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, Gabriel, who's who's going to be facilitating the chat. Gabriel, can I ask you to just to say hello and introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And uh, good afternoon all. My name is Gabriel Moody. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, I am the GMTS Leadership Development Coordinator for Attraction Recruitment. I work alongside Andrew and today I'm going to be sort of facilitating the chat and just taking care of you all. So uh, really nice to meet you all. Thank you, Gabriel. And we're joined by two, um, well, I say, I say one trainee and one uh, alumni uh, of the scheme. Um, Beth, can I ask you to, to say hello and introduce yourself? Yep. Um, hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon and thanks for joining. Yeah, um, so I am a recent graduate of the Policy and Strategy Specialism of the GMTS. Um, so I've recently kind of graduated in about two months into my post scheme role um, following the Policy and Strategy Specialism. Thank you, Beth. And Chiara? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm a Policy and Strategy trainee and I have just started my second year um, on the scheme. Lovely. Thank you very much. And thank you again so much for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. I know you're probably both, both very busy uh, and I've got lots going on, so do appreciate you taking the time out. Um, let's just talk through what the session is going to cover today. So we'll focus really on, on giving a broad overview of, of the NHS Graduate Management Training Scheme with a um, slight more of a focus on policy and strategy specifically so that you get a, a better idea of what that specialism entails, um, you know, how it fits into the scheme as a whole. Um, we'll also look at the structure of the scheme and, and ultimately what the purpose of the scheme is. We will touch on the application assessment and selection process. We won't spend too long on that because we're going to share some resources with you. I think you'll find really useful. Uh, applications are currently open. Um, so if you are considering applying, then, then now is absolutely the time to do it. If you have any specific questions about the process, then absolutely do ask those in the chat. Importantly, though, we're going to hear from both Beth and Chiara about their experiences on the scheme, um, just to give you a really good idea about the type of work that you'll be doing and actually whether you feel that it's the type of work that you would like to be doing and it fits into your longer term career aspirations. And then importantly, at the end, you know, if there are any questions you've got, we'll try and address those uh, all at the end. And, um, you know, we'll run probably to about quarter past three. Uh, if you do have to go, then that's fine. We are going to record the session um, and we'll make that available. Uh, later by the website. OK, so hopefully everyone joining us today um, has started thinking about their longer term uh, in, in a professional future. Um, and you clearly have done a little bit of research about the NHS. And the NHS is an organisation that most people are, are familiar with. We do tend to think of the National Health Service as a singular organisation. It's easy to understand why. The reality is, though, that the NHS is it's actually made up of 8,300 or so different separate organisations, all providing various different parts of, of health and care um, to service users. The organisation as a whole, the NHS and all its different component parts, is, is one of the largest organisations, in, largest employers in the world. Depending on the source of information that, that you access, we're somewhere between the fifth and the seventh largest employer in the world as a whole. Okay. It's been in existence for 75 years now, so we've had the 75th anniversary this year. And the Graduate Management Training Scheme has been around for 65 of those. OK, and it's always been an important part of leadership development within the service as a whole. The King's Fund uh, estimate that now post COVID, there are about 1.6 million patient interactions each day. OK, so about 570 million a year uh, and with 1.3 million employees and 330 different uh, occupations within the National Health Service, you can see that it's a significantly sized, complex organisation, but it's got one core goal, and that is to uh, service patients to provide healthcare free at the point of delivery. One other common feature 
are the, the values that the NHS hold. And you'll find these no matter where the, wherever you go within those 8,300 organisations. So you can see those six values on screen. Working together for patients. Patients come first in everything that, that we do. Uh, respect and dignity, that we value every person as an individual. We respect their aspirations and their commitments in life. Commitment to quality of care. Insisting uh, on best patient experience at all times. At, at all times. Compassion is central to the care that the NHS provides, uh, and it's important that we respond with humanity and kindness to each person's pain, distress, or need. Improving lives, that we strive to improve health and well-being for all uh, all service users, and that my you know my important value or my my favourite value that I feel is quite important is that everyone counts. You know that we maximise our resources for the benefit of the whole community. Uh, each and every individual, we make sure that no one is excluded, dis discriminated against or left behind. Now, while you'll find these values across all parts of the NHS, they are very important to the, the GMTS as well. We're not going to be assessing you against these and, you know, we're certainly not going to ask you to learn them. But, you know, I would ask that you think really carefully about how these values align with your own personal values. And that will give you a good steer as to whether we, as a, a an employment scheme, as a graduate scheme, you know, really fit with what you're looking for out of a professional career. So let's talk about the GMTS specifically. Uh, so we are a fast track leadership development program in every sense. OK, so that the scheme is specifically focused on non clinical management training. All right. Across six different specialisms. Uh, today we're talking about policy and strategy, but we'll talk through uh, and touch on the other five specialisms as well. So if you are interested in one or more of them, then you'll get at least get some information on them. The key purpose of the scheme is to develop senior NHS leaders in the future. Now, I think at one point many years ago, the scheme, when it started, it had 12 participants. Uh, I think 11 of those were male when there was one female uh, trainee at the time, and they were very focused on moving towards uh, uh, chief executive roles, okay, chief, chief executive officer roles or executive positions. The scheme isn't really focused on that. Um, now, it's very much looking towards the development of senior managers within the NHS. Um, we are, however, developing people at pace. So it is, in essence, a fast track scheme because uh, those at similar bandings won't move as fast as you because you have access to many more experiences than other, train than, than other individuals within the NHS. Its key purpose is very important, and it's important to think about whether the aims of the scheme and this employment opportunity fit with what you're looking for out of out of a role, out of a professional employment role. We've just welcomed 250 individuals to the September 2023 cohort uh, who've now been with us for, for nearly two months now. Uh, this application round is now looking to find the next 250 trainees for next year's intake in September 2024. So it may well be that you are currently studying at university in your final year. That's absolutely fine. Uh, you can still apply now. Or it may well be that you finished university a few years ago and are now thinking about your next step. So that would also be appropriate. The strength of the scheme, I think, is very much in the support that uh, the scheme provides and the networks that are made, made available to trainees. Um, we are currently, in fact, um, what well, we were last year, number two in the Times Top 100 list. This year we've actually, so we're number three, but we've been in the top 10 since 2003. And the reason we highlight this is, is not because it's the most important thing to us, but, but more that it's uh, to demonstrate the scheme is exceptionally well regarded and it has a lot of experience in providing leadership development training. We do recruit from, recruit from a really broad base uh, of applicants, and I think every year, and I'm sure there'll be questions today that will ask, you know, what is it that we're looking for? OK, uh, that's quite an easy question to answer, but also quite complex. So, as I said, we recruit from a broad base. Each year we have somewhere between 15 and 20,000 applications uh, for those 250 scheme places. They are predominantly from uh, graduates, but not necessarily recently. And we do also actively recruit from within the NHS. Um, what is common about applicants is they all uh, share the same ambition. Uh, they're all motivated to make a difference within the health and care sector, and they all demonstrate really strong set of values. OK, so they're values driven individuals. We're not looking for people with experience specifically in the health and care sector. So the degree that you are required to have as a minimum eligibility requirement. It needs to be a 2-2. It doesn't have to be in any particular subject, so you don't need to be studying a degree that's related to health and care at all. 
Uh, you do need, however, to have the right to work in the UK at the start of the scheme and be able to demonstrate that you have a pathway for right to work throughout the duration of the two years or the two and a half years that you're with us if you're on this finance specialism. I think what we offer really uh, importantly is the opportunity to become part of a really strong tight knit group uh, of trainees all going through the same experience, same exciting journey at the same time. OK, the scheme is quite challenging. OK, it can be really hard balancing uh, a combination of um, work based placement as well as academic commitments and training all at the same time. And because of the nature of the NHS, you know, the role can be emotionally demanding. OK. Um, but what I would say is it, it does offer a phenomenal opportunity really that isn't like any other graduate employment opportunity currently available, because from day one you will have the opportunity to uh, be given responsibility to make decisions to make change happen. Um, you know, it isn't just a job. It is an opportunity to take on leadership uh, responsibilities very early on. We don't offer a permanent role at the end of the scheme, and that can be a concern to some people. But I think, as you'll hear from uh, perhaps Beth today, um, the average salary on finishing the scheme is somewhere around £44,000 currently. Um, you know, that is an average salary. So about a third of the cohort, you know, will take on band aid roles, which is somewhere between fifty and £60,000. There is a lot of support in finding that first substantive post. So the training and education you've received are very well regarded within the NHS and there are lots of positions available. So you, you, you won't struggle to find uh, a permanent role if that's something you want to do and you're you're keen to continue your leadership development journey. Beth, can I ask you actually, I mean, uh, given that we've just been talking about that, I'm sure when you started the scheme, um, when you applied originally, you were probably looking at lots of different roles and probably considering lots of different career options. What what um, spoke to you about the NHS GMTS initially and, and what made you choose us over some some other employment opportunities you were looking at? Yeah, definitely. I think I was in that space where potentially many of the people who are joining today are at where I was in my final year of university and I was thinking about what my next steps um, could or should be and I applied to lots of different graduate schemes. I did biology for my undergraduate degree so I think I widely wanted to be, my preference was to be in the health space because that's where I had um, a lot of kind of you know my, my skill set and, and past experience but um, whilst I was kind of when I was 15, 16 and also whilst um, in the summers from university I worked in my local community pharmacy and I worked in my local GP surgery as well and I think that really kind of spoke to me about how important the NHS is um, in you know improving care for patients and also as kind of community hubs as well um, and so th I think kind of prior to applying to graduate schemes I already knew that what the NHS values were and had seen other NHS employees really live the NHS values um, and because the NHS graduate scheme was kind of so geared towards that as well that really appealed to me and um, so I applied to lots of different graduate schemes but the NHS um, one was the top of my top of my list and so I was really pleased when I was offered offered a place. And we're very pleased to have you part of the scheme as well. Uh, Kiara, can I ask you, I mean, um, I, I'm going to make the assumption that your situation was was different, but possibly similar in some ways. What, what attracted um, you to the scheme in the first instance? Yeah, so slightly different to Beth. I had been working for a year um, when I applied to the scheme and I was looking for a role, um, which kind of, I think, challenged me a bit more than where I was currently working. And I decided that public policy was definitely a space which I was interested in. So I was looking at different roles within that kind of sector. What drew me specifically to the GMTS? Um, I think there was a, fact, a number of things. So the fact that it was fast paced and you get a lot of responsibility for early on was definitely something which appealed to me. Um, the educational component, I think, is quite unique um, to the GMTS, the ability to get those qualifications whilst working. Um, and also just the number of different placements and the different opportunities that you have. I think they were just, yeah, the things which appealed to me specifically to the GMTS. There's, there's a lot of variety, isn't there? And I think we'll talk through in a minute um, that there are lots of different uh, options in terms of the experience, because it's not it's not a scheme where we we make leaders and there's, you know, we have a, a small machine that people come in one end and then they pop out two years later as a fully formed leader. There, there is a lot of opportunity to shape the experience yourself because we're looking for people to actually contribute themselves and develop their own passions and interests. Let, let's talk about what the scheme consists of then. Um, when when uh, candidates first come to the website, the first thing you really have to start thinking about is which specialism. Now, uh, both Beth and Chiara are both policy and strategy trainees uh, and, and alumni. Um, uh, we have six different specialisms, so 
uh, general management, human resources, finance, health informatics, health analysis and policy and strategy. Now, they are all slightly different. OK, policy and strategy specifically and health analysis are uh, slightly different to the other four in that they are predominantly based within NHS England. We'll look through the structure of uh, the organisation in a minute, but um, because of the fact that you're based within NHS England, the, the structure of your uh, scheme is ever so slightly different to the other four specialisms. OK, you're working within NHS England, which is ostensibly a non-clinical component of uh, the health service. Uh, all other specialisms are based in the seven regions of, of uh, England and will be based in acute trusts or foundation trusts. So it's, it's a slightly different experience, as you'll see in a minute. I think the key thing, though, to highlight when you're thinking about picking your specialism, think really carefully about what interests you. OK, think carefully about what you're passionate about and what sort of uh, skills and experience you'd like to develop um, you know, for your own professional journey. OK, the, sch the scheme is quite difficult. It is challenging. Uh, you know, as I said, it is two years or two and a half years if you're on the finance specialism. So what's really important to us is that you know, you are able to be successful over that period of time. OK, and that success is inextricably linked to how much you're going to enjoy the experience. If you're, you know, if you picked a specialism that actually, you know, you, you've discovered you don't really enjoy, you know, the type of work doesn't really align with, you know, your personal preferences, then you're going to find the scheme very hard. I'll highlight really now finance and health informatics and health analysis as three specialisms that are highly numerate. OK, if you are interested in either of those three, we have run other webinars where traders and alumni have spoken about their experience. Um, finance specifically is, is a is a very challenging specialism because of the amount of education, amount of uh, study that is required. And I think also for health informatics and health analysis, they are very analytical specialisms. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of management of numbers, um, a lot of analysis. If you are not predisposed to that or it's not something that you particularly enjoy, you are going to find those specialisms particularly challenging. So do think very carefully about that. So let's talk about what the experience is then and, and how policy and strategy, you know, perhaps slightly different differs to the, the other five. All specialisms will have three key components that I think we want to highlight to you today. So the first is that work experience component. So uh, all trainees will undertake three or more work placements. Um, you know, one of those will be a flexi placement. That's it may well be within the NHS. It may well be at an external organisation, possibly within the private sector uh, or the charity sector. And we encourage trainees to identify something they're interested in. They leave. Um, you know, their, their placement role and they take on that, that flexible placement for two months to develop their own interests uh, and actually then continue developing competencies that perhaps they haven't had the opportunity to do uh, in their original role. Second key component is the education. So we touched briefly on the fact that all trainees will undertake a postgraduate certificate in healthcare leadership uh, and then all specialisms bar general management will also undertake uh, a postgraduate um, uh, diploma in a qualification specific to that specialism. And we'll give you the list in a second. The last, and I think probably the most exciting component really, is the leadership development and the experiential learning that you, you'll have the opportunity to uh, engage with. Many other graduate schemes and, and graduate roles, you know, are in effect uh, employment with a little bit of training. I think the GMTS scheme is very much a combination of work, but a lot of support and a lot of experiential learning and leadership development to enable you to discover your own leadership approach. Uh, because in essence, while you are following a specialism route, we are helping trainees um, develop a foundational expertise in that specialism that allows them to go on at pace to take on leadership roles uh, across most of the NHS. OK, there's a lot of opportunity to move from specialism once you finish the scheme. And indeed, we see lots of trainees moving from different specialisms into other areas because there's there's a lot of different uh, possibilities in terms of career pathway. So let's talk about that that placement uh, experience. So on the whole, most trainees will follow this pattern. OK, it is slightly different for policy and strategy, which I'll show on the next slide. But ostensibly, most trainees that join the scheme you know, don't have any experience within the NHS and we're not expecting you to have any. So your first placement tends to be much more operational in nature. OK, so you may well be placed 
uh, in a foundation trust or um, a uh, community or mental health trust, possibly even a primary care setting. And, and you'll be focused on relatively reactive tasks, looking at the operation of that organisation or that team that you're based with and finding solutions. For example, it may well be the likes of managing bed shortages or managing rotors or looking at other individual specific challenges to that organisation. The second placement does tend to be much more strategic because your, your development needs will have evolved, will have changed over the time you've been with us over that first year. And so you'll have the opportunity to pick up much more strategic projects. It may well be that you are um, you know, analysing information, leading on a project, making recommendations, possibly bringing different stakeholders together across organisational boundaries, which can indeed be quite challenging. With the development of integrated care systems, the 42 ICSs around England, there's lots of opportunity for trainees now working in roles to bring different partners together uh, across organisational boundary lines to solve the challenges for the health and care system in that area. For policy and strategy, the experience is, is slightly different. And the reason being is that trainees are based within NHS England. So your first placement will be based within NHS England. Um, You'll be there for eight months in that first role, and then you'll move into a second operational placement uh, somewhere within uh, the region you're based. OK, now the reason for that is because it's really important that while you're working on policy within an HSE, that you really have a good connection to the patient experience. OK, now that's really, really central uh, to the values of the NHS, that even as a non-clinical manager, that you really have an understanding of the patient's experience, an understanding of the work that clinicians are doing. That's really key. Once you finish that operational placement, you'll move into your flexi placement for two months and then back into NHS England into what is ostensibly your third placement. OK, so you'll be back in NHS in a slightly different strategic policy role. Beth, can I ask you, I mean, the, the shape of the experience is slightly different for trainees. How did you find the transition from working in a non-clinical environment, in effect, within the NHS England and moving into that operational placement? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think actually for, for me, it was slightly different because of um, kind of recovery from COVID that I didn't actually have an operational placement, but I can. But the vast majority of the other policy and strategy trainees within my cohort did. And I think they found it really, really insightful because in your first placement, you're really kind of getting to grips really with understanding the NHS as a whole, but understanding from a national perspective how you set policy and strategy and also how you implement it as well. And I think sometimes you can feel, you know, the work that you do is really powerful, but you don't really see it being implemented in, in you know, kind of in real life or, you know, near patients. And I think that lots of trainees found a, a real great insight in seeing that on the ground. Um, but in other ways as well, even, you know, throughout your NHS England placements, um, you also have opportunities to go and visit hospitals or visit GP centres. Um, you know, I'm I'm planned to, to go to um, on an ambulance ride out um, in a couple of weeks time um, because there is a acknowledgement and recognition that we also need to be close to if we can't you know every day be close to patient delivery of care then we should as much as we can kind of understand what it's like on the ground for um our operational staff as well but yeah I'd say for the vast majority of trainees it was a, a you know an adjustment period because it's very different from working in an office environment to then going working on a ward for example and mm -hmm. um, but found it really valuable and you just kind of have so many more insights about kind of what are the barriers to but also opportunities in policy and strategy implementation kind of in further strategic roles in the future. Mm. And, and Chiara, I mean, you are currently in your operational placement, I would imagine, uh, given that you're within the first year of your scheme experience. How are you finding that currently? Um, yeah, so similar to Beth, I'm still not in a clinical setting and that I am in an ICB. Um, so I think the work is similar in that it's still very project management approach, but I think being that bit more local, um, similar to what Beth was saying, I have done lots more site visits and lots more talking to patients. And I think being that bit closer to the patient, to the population, having a specific population that you're working with, you can have, identify their needs. Um, so I've, but again, like Beth said, speaking to other trainees who have been in the clinical setting, they found it extremely valuable. Um, again, focusing more on that implementation side of things. Um, and I've actually decided to do my flexi in a trust because of that. And I do think it's really valuable experience. I mean, that answers my next question. <laughs> I was going to ask what, what your plans were for your flexi, because lots of trainees do uh, take the opportunity to leave the NHS because they might not have worked in other, uh, you know, so they 
that want to go and, and try out the charity sector or the private sector. Uh, I was speaking to a trainer the other day who's working in the banking sector um, and leadership is, is, is an active in a very, very different way. You've chosen to go and work in your flexi in the NHS in a more operational setting to get more of that experience. That's brilliant. Um, in, in terms of the, the structure for all other trainees, um, it does follow a, a, a pretty standard pattern of the first 12 months is in your operational placement, followed by your flexi, followed by your second placement. Uh, the scheme ostensibly is two years. People do start, there is a window towards the end as you're looking for your first substantive role where you are able to leave as long as you've completed all of the education on scheme. Policy trustee trainees we've, and health analysis trainees, we've, we've referenced our base within NHS England. Uh, just to sort of uh, touch on the structure of NHSE, we have been going through uh, quite a period of organisational change. Um, you know, the structure of, of NHSE has changed quite considerably in the last year and we are still going through some change and that's, that's um, scheduled to finish sort of early next year. Uh, you can see that there are um, within the organisation as a whole, it's split across a number of different directorates that are focused on very different areas of work. And underneath that uh, sit various different regional teams across the seven regions of England. Um, you know, the design for NHS England, you know, does it does now incorporate what was NHS Digital okay, and Health Education England. So it's, it's quite a sizable organisation, all working on different bits of uh, work streams to support the work of uh, trusts in and around the country. If you've got any questions specifically about NHS England as a whole, do pop those in the comment in the in the chat and we'll try and answer those. There's a lot of information online specifically about NHSE if that's of interest to you so you can see where the sort of different opportunities lie in terms of the work streams. So we've touched a little bit on, on the education already. Um, both Beth and Co have, have sort of highlighted they've had the opportunity to go and uh, look at different parts of services. Now, when you start your experience, irrespective of where you're based, whether that's uh, in a trust or within NHS England, you will have the opportunity to undertake 20 days of orientation. Now, it is split up slightly differently for policy and strategy trainees, but the key is that you have an opportunity to get a broader understanding about the different sorts of services that provide the different roles that uh, exist within a hospital trust or within NHS England. Um, you have the ability to shape that in part, so it will be organised for you once you begin your experience on the scheme. But if there's something you're particularly interested in, there's always the opportunity to speak to your current manager and say, look, I'm really interested in uh, paramedic services, for example, or interested in how mental health services are enacted, and, and that can be incorporated into the experience for you. All trainees uh, do undertake the postgraduate certificate in healthcare leadership. So that's currently the Elizabeth Garrett Anderson program. Um, G general management trainees will undertake that uh, in the first year along with everybody else, and then continue that in their second year to postgraduate diploma level. All other trainees, including policy and strategy trainees, will take that until certificate level in the first year, and at the same time, be undertaking a professional qualification, which we'll highlight to you on the next slide, you know, in a uh, qualification that's specific to that specialism. Another key part of the education experience are the inclusion of action learning sets and experiential learning. And both of these, I think, are relatively unique to the scheme in the amount uh, of uh, contact you have with them both, but also what they provide. Uh, we are not expecting uh, trainees when they start the scheme to have lots of managerial experience or indeed leadership experience. And so that is a set of skills that do need to be developed. And it can be quite daunting doing that from day one with people you're working with who are exceptionally experienced clinicians or non-clinical managers. Action Learning Sets is a, uh, a combination of eight or nine uh, different days where you work with a small group of trainees uh, across the two years that you're with us and you're focused on uh, key challenges that you may well be facing in the workplace. OK, it's a safe space, but it gives you the opportunity to um, talk with others and have them ask you questions about that to help you uh, discover an answer. So it's not, it's not a, a, an opportunity for them to tell you what the answer is, but ultimately to help you understand really how to go about doing that for yourself, find your own way forward. Yeah, I can ask you because I mean, ha having started the scheme this year, 
action learning sets is usually a new um, vehicle for tackling issues that trainees face and it's something that most uh, you know recent participants of the scheme aren't familiar with how have you found that over the last year has it been useful to you what does it look like yeah definitely um i always really enjoy going to action learning sets i think partly obviously being with the same group of trainees um across the two years you do connect and you do form friendships and it is really nice to have those opportunities to speak to different trainees um also just to hear about what they're doing i think i've really benefited from ls in terms of what you were saying about developing your leadership style and developing that line of questioning and uh, try not telling others what to do but kind of encouraging them and that's what i found really useful um and again people were asking me i think it's really helped my own reflective practice and encouraged me to think about my own experiences on the scheme so far and um, so definitely yeah I, I really enjoy ALS. I think the fact that you're in the same group over a period of time I guess it helps build trust with the definitely. others that you're working with I mean I think the first session probably quite nerve-wracking in terms of uh, how much do I share I don't want to feel like I, I don't know anything but actually over time you realize it really is a useful space to say look I, I don't really know how to tackle this. Uh, let me talk you through the issue. Ask me some questions. Let me let me see if I can, you know, find the answer. Um, you know, find a way forward. And I'm, I'm guessing also, it may well be that whatever you try may not work, and so you may well bring the same issue back the next time. Beth, can I ask you about experiential learning? Because um, there are lots of different, there are five different modules of experiential learning across the two years uh, that the trainees with the scheme, and it's you know learning by doing isn't it so it's like simulation based exercises i think there's some games and interactive events using some actors um you know, how did you find that how did that contribute to your development as a as a leader within the nhs yeah i think it's really useful because whereas for example als you're bringing quite you know ex examples or work challenges that you yourself are going through and you, what the other trainees are going through kind of the the challenges that you work through or the concepts you work through in experiential learning can sometimes be quite abstract um and they can also be quite fun when you're kind of doing the games but i think that sometimes you didn't realize how much you've learned until you then encounter a different work challenge or issue and then some of the themes that you brought up in experiential learning you go oh okay you know i remember this from my experiential learning session about you know for example stakeholder management and different power dynamics and things like that and then you can then apply those lessons learned um, and I think what I really valued about experiential learning kind of above and beyond everything else is what the GMTS does is allows those kind of protected days where you go with your cohort to learn about um, leadership development reflection um, experiential learning um, and really embedding that really early in your career and I think it helps then when throughout your career knowing the value of those types of days and having space outside with your team as well and doing those types of kind of collaborative activities um, because even though it can seem quite abstract it is really important for team working and kind of trust building as well and um, so yeah I'd say I'd say both those things. Yeah, because the you know the the placement experience is in your organisation in one location, but of course the education and training is delivered in other locations, isn't it? Uh, it's delivered in Leeds or in London, uh, or in fact we may well be delivering some of it regionally. The scheme does cover all of the costs, don't they, in terms of travel and there's overnight stays required. But as we'll see on, on the next slide with some of the other education, you know, it's it's a really important opportunity to connect in person with other people uh, and specifically other trainees who are going through the experience you know so that you realize you're not on your own you know because it, otherwise it can feel quite isolating sometimes if you're dealing with quite a challenging role uh, and you know coming together with others who you realize actually are going through a, probably a very similar experience so in terms of the education we've, we've talked about some of the leadership development training and the orientation and then the uh, the ega program but I've referenced that all other specialisms uh, other than general management undertake a profession specific qualification. Uh, that's a master's level qualification, diploma level qualification, level seven. Um, it, we are currently re-procuring the education, so I'm not going to talk in detail about it. Uh, it may well be that some of the providers or some of the qualifications specifically change by next September. But I think the key thing to highlight is that, you know, we will ensure that the best providers are delivering the education, but also that we've selected the most appropriate professional uh, specific qualification for your specialism. Trainees are expected to manage, um, you know, all of the education and training and the, and the commitments of that effectively alongside the work placement. Uh, you know, hosts are very empathetic to that challenge. 
Now, there's an awful lot to juggle um, as, as long as there is good communication between the trainee and the manager and they understand when assignments are due, when exams are due, you know, they are able to flex the demands of the work placement around those. OK, it, it does require some organisation and a little bit of communication or, or rather a lot of communication with your managers. So they're really clear on, on what your what your uh, commitments are. We do have an internal education team that do account manage the external education providers um, and you will also receive a tutor specifically to manage your specific experience with that educational provider. Attending the education and training is a compulsory part of the experience, it's a really important part of the experience. You know, hosts do accommodate all of those training needs. They do all take place within the working week. Uh, so, you know, as I said, the scheme does pay for all travel and accommodation uh, for you to attend these events outside of region. But I would say, um, you know, there is like to be some demand for some study or some reading outside of those hours uh, in order to meet the, the expectations of the educational assignments that you'll have to undertake. Um, we do provide a lot of support to enable you to do that. But as I said before, Communication is absolutely key. And as long as you're talking to those around you and you've got some good organisational skills, then it should be relatively straightforward. OK. Underpinning all of this experience, as you're developing uh, your own personal leadership style, your own competency within your specialism, underpinning all of the specialisms, all of the different training roles are a set of core competencies. And you can see some of those on on uh, on screen now. And I think both Beth and Karen have referenced some of them as well, like such as project management. So all specialisms involve an element of all of these core competencies. Remember, you are developing a foundational expertise in that specialism, OK, but ultimately are working towards becoming a, a well rounded leader within the NHS uh, that has some understanding of a particular area. For the for the specialist uh, for the specialisms, so HR, finance, uh, general management, health mathematics do have some specialist competencies that have been pre-approved by relevant professional bodies. They are quite specific to those specialisms, but they they're uh, rolled into the the overall competency framework. So alongside all of the training and all of the education, uh, there's an awful lot going on for trainees, but we do offer a really comprehensive package of support. So that's really important to us that um, trainees are successful, that they join the scheme. There's no cost to trainees to join the scheme, um, but the investment in you in terms of the education and training, it's really important that you are successful uh, and that you enjoy the experience. And to make that possible, uh, you can see on screen a number of people that uh, have a vested interest in your success. The first one of those, the key first key contact really you have is your regional trainee support manager. So they are in essence a, a professional employment liaison. So you know it's it, they're not a pastoral liaison, you know, as you might have at university or, or at school or college. You know they, you know, this is full time employment. So you know they won't solve uh, challenges for you, but they will certainly support you and signpost you to various resources and help you resolve issues that you may have as they arise, because everyone's, every trainee's experience is slightly unique. Alongside that, you'll have a placement manager and a programme manager. For each of your placements, the placement manager will change because they are closely associated to the work that you're doing and the work that you're undertaking and will be your day to day line manager. Your program manager takes a much broader view of your development. Uh, they look, they sort of monitor the competency framework and, and your development within that, as well as your educational completion and how well you're doing with that component. Mentors are available for trainees. Not every trainee has a mentor, but you know if it's appropriate, you know you can secure a mentor either within your specialism, possibly within your organisation you're working in, possibly in, in another organisation, but. As both Beth and Kiara have highlighted, uh, they, uh, I understand today, were buddies when they joined. So when Kiara joined the scheme, Beth was in fact uh, Kiara's buddy. I, I think I'm right in saying that. Uh, both, we hope that's okay for me to share. Uh, many trainees have questions when they start the scheme. There's a lot going on, and you know, uh, people then want to feel foolish. So they, there are questions that you want to ask in a relatively safe space. So we will, you know, buddy you up with somebody else on the scheme. So uh, you can just touch base with them. You know, you know, call them up, ask them, ask them a question. You know, and, and they should be able to support and sign pastry to the right place. We do encourage a lot of training networking. 
Um, that's a really important, uh, important part of the experience, both in your specialism, but also within your region, um, but also nationally. So we have a number of national events where trainees will come together. There's additional training. There are conferences that you can attend and so on. And the last uh, last line of support, which I've mentioned, is the tutor that you have at the educational institution who will function in very similar way to your university tutor that you may have right now. OK, um, the scheme, the GMTS scheme is a national scheme within England. I've seen a, a couple of questions in the chat already about uh, Wales and Scotland. Um, we don't unfortunately have placements in either Wales or Scotland, but there is a, a similar scheme. It's a much, they're much smaller schemes, but there are similar schemes in Wales and Scotland. If you are going to be living in either of those uh, two countries, then do let us know. We can certainly put you in touch with those in, with those schemes specifically so that you can apply to them. Uh, you are able to specify up to three regions in which you're prepared to work. Now, I will highlight today we are sort of referencing uh, policy and strategy specifically. Uh, policy and strategy is only available as a specialism in London or in the northeastern Yorkshire region. And the reason for that is that NHS England is only based in London or in, in Leeds or in the north, north uh, eastern Yorkshire region. So if you are applying for policy and strategy, it's very important that you put either of those two regions. You'll only be allowed to select those two regions in your application. You are able to select up to three regions though, and, and if you select a second or third specialism that you're interested in, you, you can of course put other regions that you are able to work in. Do you think carefully about where you're going to be based next September? OK, it may well be that you're at university now and so are able uh, to stay or would like to stay in the region you're in. It may be that you're uh, moving home or moving closer to relatives uh, and that may well be in a different region. So do you think carefully where you're like to be based? Unfortunately, you know, we can't uh, we can't uh, specify specific towns or cities where you might be based. So the regions are geographically quite sizable. So it may well be that we'll offer you the closest placement to you wherever you're based. That may well not be close enough um, and it may well be that you're not able to accept um, the role, which would be a shame. But we will work with you to try and find you the most appropriate placement. OK, we're not going to offer you anything that you haven't suggested that you would like any of your preferences. Um, please don't uh, put three regions because you think it will uh, give you a better chance of being on the scheme. It does in some respects. East of England, the southeast and the southwest are regions where uh, fewer applicants are selecting they would like to work. But if you aren't able to work in that region, then you are no more likely to receive an offer to work on to work in the scheme. And if we do call you about a, a placement in that region and you aren't able to accept, we will be needing to offer that to somebody else. OK, that's been a, a really quick whistle stop tour really across lots of different parts of the scheme. Uh, on screen, you can just see the benefits that, the, that are offered. So currently the salary is paid at 65% uh, of uh, the agenda for change band six. So next year that will be £27,701. Um, there are 27 days annual leave and access to the NHS pension as well. Uh, I would say, and I've referenced the average salary on finishing the scheme is around about £44,000. And if Career progression is really important to you. Um, you know, the scheme is uh, a scheme in which you will see significant progression if that's uh, that's a key aim for you. I think those that are very career minded, the average time to direct a level is somewhere between six and eight years if, if that's of interest. OK. We'll touch briefly on the recruitment uh, process. Um, my colleague Gabe was going to post a link to our preparation hub in the uh, chat. I would encourage everyone today to go and have a look at that link and to do register for the preparation hub. You will have a lot of information about the assessment process and you will have an opportunity to try out some of the assessments and see how the mechanics work. OK, um, when you apply, the application form doesn't require a personal statement and it doesn't require uh, any any work history. Uh, it is purely your personal details. Once you've completed that, you will be given access to the online assessment. It's a strength based assessment. So I know that people will be asking, you know, how can I prepare for that? Well, the best way to prepare really is to think about those values, think about how they align to your personal values. Um, there are no wrong answers, no right answers in any of the questions within the assessments. We are assessing against a series of strengths that are aligned to those NHS values. So it's a values orientated assessment. OK, if you're successful at the first and then the second online assessments will invite you to a, a half day 
assessment centre experience, and they take place in January and February. If you're successful at that, then we'll be looking at making offers uh, for the scheme next year at the end of March, uh, and then the onboarding process will take place over the subsequent months. Do go and visit the Preparation Hub. It will give you an awful lot more information. Uh, I said, if you do have any questions, then do post them in the chat about that. And we can certainly address them uh, specifically. OK, I'm, I'm very aware of time. We are going to run over uh, the hour, but I'm, I'm really keen to hear uh, a bit more about uh, the experience of both Beth and Chiara uh, so that you can get an, an understanding of what the work is like, really. Beth, thank you again for joining us. Um, I mean, for your contributions so far. I think lots of participants to these webinars, they're really keen to understand actually what is it you do on a day to day basis? What does a, a policy and strategy trainee do? What was your experience like? Yeah, sure. I'll kind of split it into my time on the scheme versus kind of my post scheme role now. Um, so my first role was in NHS England, obviously, um, working within um, the personalised care group. So their policy and strategic focus was designed around giving more personalised, person centred um, and focused care towards individuals. So I was working in the kind of measurement and intelligence team using data, data reporting and data strategy to kind of set the vision for the future of personalised care. Um, and then my second placement, I worked in the private office of the National Director for Primary and Community Care um, and so kind of each national director who is um, responsible for a really large portfolio of policy and strategy across NHS England. They have their own individual teams to help them manage the hundreds of requests that come through their inbox um, every single day and I really loved that because it was a role that really kept me on my toes. You never knew what every single day was going to bring so it really made me kind of a lot more comfortable with change than I probably was before because I kind of would have a to-do list every day and then would get to work and then I'd go okay that's out the window with there's a you know something has come in from a minister or sometimes the prime minister and had a really strategic focus and wanted to have an update on something and you'd have to turn all of your attention and focus to that my flexi placement I really wanted to kind of um, get outside the NHS and understand about a kind of more zoomed out lens which sounds a bit interesting because NHS England already is a little bit more zoomed out but I really wanted to learn more about kind of other partner um, organisations as well so I went to a think tank called the King's Fund and they do loads of amazing commentary mm -hmm. on um, the health and social care sector loads of really great research as well that can help inform NHS and social care organisations about how to improve their care um, and also to how to improve things for their staff as well so I did a research project on health inequalities there and I learned so much about kind of the wider sector um, and also was really useful to understand a bit more of that blue sky thinking and um, to kind of be a bit removed from the NHS and understand actually what is in the art of the possible and what things are we not really thinking about and then my final placement I was back at NHS England um, in a very policy focused role working on nursing workforce policy so a lot of that was very much about kind of um, the long-term workforce plan for the NHS has been recently published looking to the next 15 years and how we're going to support our staff and increase the number of our staff but also you know how the different ways in which the NHS staff can work as well for the benefit of them of patients and um, so that was really great to think about what things do we need for the next 15 years to help kind of realize that vision and um, so that was really really um, interesting so I would say overall you know my experience is very different to some of the other trainees in my cohort um, and that's because NHS England there's such a vast number of both clinical and non-clinical areas that you can work on in terms of the policy and strategy some people work in prevention some people work in strategic finance people work you know across um, everywhere but um, really gives you a great idea into kind of how decisions are made and what different factors are really critical and um, you really get a great insight into kind of the political um, sphere as well and how that impacts upon the um, the decisions that are made within the NHS too um, and yeah uh, my post scheme role um, I am now working in the national ambulance team so I'm still within NHS England um, and wanted to kind of maintain that national policy making approach um, day to day looks very different I'm um, just starting out it's um, a very workforce focused um, so my day can be looking at the data that we have nationally um, as well and kind of looking how to improve that data, what insights we can get out of that data. It can be attending sessions of best practice to sort of see how some ambulance services are really working to improve the health and well-being of their workforce so they're kind of more, they're more healthy and happy at work too. Sometimes uh, my day consists of things like this um, and you know speaking to people who are interested in the in the graduate scheme as well. Also facilitating kind of workshops and speaking to other stakeholders in the ambulance service but also charities as well and seeing how we can combine efforts as well to try and improve things for, for staff as well but always with that kind of focus on patient care at the very centre of everything we're doing um, and that has kind of been the one 
the, if I could say that the one consistent thing throughout all of my placements is is that is that I focus on on patient care at, at the very end of the day. So so yeah, um, kind of the. The, the roles that are available at the end of the scheme and like um as we mentioned here the scheme is very well um, respected and known throughout the nhs and beyond so yeah people kind of know that you you are on a fast track scheme um and you've learned a lot in the in the two years that you've been on the scheme i mean it's fascinating I, and i i love uh you know undertaking these webinars because i get to hear a lot about what trainees have been doing you know during the scheme and then you know like yourself you know post scheme and i think something you've touched on is the, the sheer variation in what you you've worked on the different projects you've worked on and actually that's very common for all trainees across all specialisms so we have 250 that start each year and i would say that every single one of them has a, has a pretty unique experience in terms of the work that they're doing um, there are things where there are common work streams but very different projects so and it's i think we could probably spend hours and hours on course like this actually going into depth about the sorts of things you've done the impact that you've made it sounds absolutely fascinating thank you beth kiara I'm, I'm thinking your experience i mean you know we might think that as a policy and strategy trainee your experience would be very similar but but tell us I mean, what's it like for you on scheme what what things are you working on what does your day look like um, so I, my first placement was in the national strategy team in NHS England and Beth's already touched on the NHS workforce plan and that was my first placement actually that's my first project was working on writing that document and I think definitely when I joined as a trainee that was it really forced me to it because you worked with everyone across the whole NHS it really just took into every different component of the NHS and it really helped my understanding of it as a big organisation um, and in that project, I got to work on so many different things. So a lot of it was desk research, trying to understand different roles um, a lot of stakeholder management and but also some kind of more data, some modelling, projections, strategic finance. Like it really covered so many different areas. Um, and then where I am now in an ICB, so similar work, but slightly different with a slightly different focus. So similar project management approach and kind of problem solving. Um, techniques but I've been working on a learning from best practice project so a lot of it has been going to sites speaking to GPs to doctors to patients trying to understand what they've been doing which works really well and then also how best to share that um that knowledge and understanding with different practices um so holding workshops chairing meetings um which has been really really nice again having the chance to speak to patients has been really valuable and, and that's really interesting to hear you say that as well, because um, we, we've had lots of questions of people interested in the policy and strategy specialism. And there is at times, uh, you know, lots of uh, research and reading to be done. There's lots of, you know, understanding different policies and how they work together and, and you know, but actually, you know, that conception of being in an office and looking through that material isn't really what you're describing and what you're describing is quite exciting in that you are very much connecting with the people within NHS you're going out you're talking to clinicians you're talking to nurses you're talking to different stakeholder groups uh or you know within the NHS as a whole people experience that in if to try and put together a policy or trying to to look at you know what the NHS might do in terms of moving one particular area of health and care um I think that, that's fascinating is that I would say is that a more enjoyable part of the role for you than you know looking at a lot of the very important but and valuable research that you have to do but is it more is it more enjoyable to work with with other stakeholders and the people out within the NHS um I think for me I really enjoy a mix of the both um I think it's really important to have an understanding of the policies before you go and speak to people I think I quite enjoy having the time and the ability to actually digest that information um but then like you said I it is really really nice to actually be able to speak to people Alec, get their opinions um and then you can kind of have a more of a holistic approach to things um so I, I really enjoy the combination of having both and and that's another key point isn't it that old you know some people feel that the policy and strategy specialism has been said is you know thought of as a more important specialism this where all the decisions are taken but the reality is you are taking a very broad higher level look at policy and then there's lots of layers of enactment of that policy and how it's integrated you know within the other parts of the the very complex set of organizations that make up the nhs um, so it isn't just one thing is it? it's it's trying to think about how this might then be enacted for others in other situations and then helping them do that 
Thank you very much, Kai. That, that's been fantastic. I'm just looking at the time. I can see we've had lots and lots of questions coming in. Uh, Gabriel, I, I'm sure you were in the background there. Um, is there a good place to start with the questions? Uh, I think the best place that we can share with Beth and Kiara. I think the best place to start would be at the beginning. Um, I've highlighted some questions. So the first question uh, is, is there a specific set of criteria that applicants are judged against? Um, so that's that's a hard question to answer. Actually, it, it's a combination of yes and no. So, um, you know, we uh, assess applications uh, against their strengths, a uh, set of strengths. So there's no filtering, no selection uh, undertaken at the application form stage. OK, it's purely just a collection of, of your data, your information and your preferences. Um, when you undertake the online assessments, Again, the strengths that we're assessing against are strengths that have been identified as those uh, more successful for leadership, okay, and, and to, to highlight high potential within candidates. Um, they are closely aligned to the, the NHS values, which is why I referenced those. Um, so there, there isn't, you know, when you answer the questions, we're looking for people to answer authentically. And that's really important. That's the same all the way through in all of the assessments. If you are answering the questions, uh, authentically, okay, the way that you think you would operate. You know, we accept a very diverse mix of individuals onto the scheme, a very diverse uh, cross section of backgrounds, of lived experiences. Um, you know, so there isn't really one collection of responses that will be successful. There's a whole mix. Now, we have a question here from Helen who asks Can the placements be near where you live? There are lots of healthcare settings in Southampton, so would all three placements be able to be near Southampton or would you potentially have to relocate? And if you have long term health conditions, uh, can the work be hybrid between going into placement some days but remote other days? So there's, there's a lot of parts to that. So for policy and strategy specifically, um, placements are only within London or within the or within Leeds or within the northeast and Yorkshire region. That's really important to understand. OK, so if you're here today thinking that you, you would like to apply for policy and strategy, then it's really important to understand the placements are in London. Your office space will be in London or it will be in northeastern Yorkshire and you would need to select one of those two regions. If you are applying for any other specialism, you can indeed highlight the southeast region around Southampton um, as a region that you would like to be based in. If you are successful after assessment centre, we will speak to you uh, and we will make you an offer of the most uh, appropriate or the closest placement to you uh, to make that work. Generally, all placements are within um, the same provider, the same host provider. There are cases where it may be more than one host, uh, but they'll be relatively close together usually. Uh, Teo asks, can you apply for more than one different scheme? So uh, when you apply, you do make a preference. So we think very carefully about what specialism preference you have. You are able to identify a second or indeed a third specialism if you are genuinely interested in those. Um, there's no need to put extra specialisms or extra regions if if you can't work in them or you're not interested in those specialisms. Um, but you know, if if you do have, for example, many policy and strategy. Uh, applicants will put general management as a second choice specialism because they're very keen to work within the scheme, within the health and care sector, and they know that actually longer term they're relatively interchangeable. OK, um, so you can put more than one, but you will only be able to apply once. OK, so you don't need to make more than one application. Uh, we have quite a lot of visa questions, but I'll just pick this one. Uh, I think for now, I think the rest of the information is on our website. Uh, but uh, Han asks, I'm currently on a T4 visa and I need a T2 visa in the future. Is this going to affect my application? So in short, we are able to offer sponsorship to applicants, but only in the London region. OK, so if, if sponsorship is an issue for you or you need um, some form of uh, visa, working visa right to work, uh, or it's going to run out at some point during your experience on the scheme, you will need to have applied to the London region and be based in the London region for us to be able to support you with a sponsorship application. OK, uh, if your current visa or right to work expires before the scheme starts next September, unfortunately, you won't be eligible to apply because you won't have the right to work at the time the scheme starts. If your current right to work expires during the scheme, so after September 20, 
24. I think I've seen a question from someone about their their current visa expiring in November. Then as long as you've finished university and you know you are in the London region, then we are able to then sponsor you uh, and support you with a certificate of sponsorship application. But the London region is the only region we can do that in because the salary requirements for the occupation code that we have to use, the salary requirements are only met in that region, unfortunately. I think following on from that just quickly, uh, you asks, I currently am waiting still on my national insurance number. Will it affect my application? No, I mean, you, you can add that later. I think, um, you know, the requirement for that, you know, if you if you currently don't have one, then you can indicate that on the form. Um, I think the key thing is that you do need to have the right to work next September. OK, so whatever your current situation is, it's it's just really important that you have the right to work when the scheme starts. And then if you require further sponsorship or a visa after that, that you are in the, the London region. Uh, Mirabel asks, do I need a prior lead, any prior leadership experience or prior knowledge of policy within the NHS? Hmm. So well, well, let's pass that to, to Beth and Chiara. So I don't know if, who would like to take that question. Um, any volunteers? Do we need leadership or policy experience before starting the scheme? Yeah, I'm happy to come in on this one. Um, I would say the kind of answer is no, especially not formally. So I wouldn't say at all, um, because really what throughout the assessment process is looking for your potential and also your values and how that aligns to the NHS. But I would say that, you know, you can also pull on kind of informal experiences as well, where you've shown a leadership capacity um, to, you know, throughout the assessment process. It could be things you've done at university, part time jobs um, and, and things like that as well, but not formally. No, it's kind of looking at your your future potential and the leader that you could become. Um, and that, that's what they're looking for. I think that's that's fair to say. Yeah, I think that's probably a, um, a very well rounded answer and the same for other specialisms as well. You know, we're not expecting people to have expertise currently in any of those. If you do have some, and I, I've seen someone indicate that they have some accountancy experience already and they've worked professionally uh, in another sector, then, then that's absolutely fantastic and that will certainly be useful to you. But we're not expecting you to have lots of uh, knowledge or experience with the NHS or within a particular specialism area. Uh, Jamie asks, how are location preferences considered? For example, if we're unable to leave our region, we'll be able to complete the vast majority of the scheme within one region. So the the specialism preferences are an indication of where you would like to be based. Um, and we will only, um, well, we will go by the preferences that you've indicated to us. There are lots of, you can change that preference between now and, and you know, the end of VACs. And even at the point where if we're fortunately be able to offer you a role, we will confirm your preferences and just check that we have uh, a role that you know is applicable to those. Um, we've indicated around the education that you know while you'd be based in a region in a in a host uh, in your work placement, the education and training does take place elsewhere. Okay, and that is an, an important part of the experience as well. We do cover all the costs to travel to Leeds uh, or to any of the training. Uh, some of the qualifications that are undertaken in different specialisms, you know, there are remote components. Um, you know, I think for policy and strategy specifically, some of the education is delivered remotely, but there are residentials as well for different specialisms, you know, and you will be expected to attend those, but all costs, as I said, are covered for that. Uh, Teo asks, can you apply with your master's degree instead or does it have to be your first degree? No, absolutely. We have people who've, who've applied for the scheme uh, with their master's. Um, you know, as long as you've met the minimum eligibility requirement, you will need to demonstrate your original degree as well uh, if you have that. But, you know, we have trainees on scheme who have undertaken doctorates, who have PhDs. Um, you know, it is a minimum um, eligibility expectation. Um, you know, it's certainly not... Uh, you know, if you if you have more than that, then you're not able to apply. You absolutely are. Uh, our next question is: How long should my CV be, and are there any specific experiences that should be highlighted? Yeah, so I, I think I mentioned earlier in in the application section, we we aren't looking for your work experience in the application form. So you know, at no point actually, um, you know, during the application assessment process, are we asking you to give us your prior work history? It will purely be your personal details and your preferences for the scheme, and that will allow you access to the assessment process. 
if you are successful in securing a role, you will need to provide that. OK, you will need to provide your employment history, but it's not part of the selection process. OK. Uh, how many have been how many have been chosen for the policy stream this year? Uh, so the year just gone, I think there were 20 places for policy and strategy. Um, that's pretty consistent. You know, the majority of trainees that start the scheme are general management. The percentages do change each year based on the number of uh, bids and number of hosts available. Um, we consistently offer um, in around 250 training places, but said the combination of those and the percentage of those for different specialisms does change, and that does depend on the hosts that are offering those placements. Evie asks, during the interview, what are you looking for in candidates that can lead to successful recruitment? OK, Kiara, can I come to you for that one? So, I mean, during the assessment centre is the only time where you 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 undertake a strength based interview. Um, you know, what was that experience like for you? And, and have you got any advice for the for the attendee today about how to how to come across in the best way? Um, so I, I have to say, surprisingly enjoyed the assessment centre, um, which is not what something I was expecting to say. Um, I think the main thing, I think you touched on it earlier, Andrew, was to be authentic and don't overthink, don't think oh, I should be doing this, I should be saying this. Just approach it as yourself. Again, think about the values, think about your own values. And the best thing is, yeah, don't overthink it. Try and enjoy it. Genuinely try and enjoy it. <laughs> Beth, I don't do your experience would have been slightly different. The assessment process has changed a little bit, um, but I mean, do you? Is that good advice? Or do you have any other advice that you might be able to offer? Definitely, I think that it's definitely your personal values and how much alignment they have to the NHS values. So, a top tip for me is always making sure you're just familiarised with them and also kind of just yourself do a bit of a self reflection and think about whether or not that aligns to your values because the, the scheme definitely really instills them in you. Um, and I would say just generally on having a, a really high level understanding of kind of the, the the priorities of the NHS as a whole and the direction that the NHS as an organization is is looking to, to to go to go in in the next you know five 10 15 years um looking at what's in the in the news of the NHS at the moment understanding the pressures as well that's always a really good thing but you don't need to know anything in detail you don't need to have like you said prior experience but yeah definitely being confident um kind of really being yourself and yeah, there isn't any kind of tricks that people are looking for at the assessment, assessment centre there's no trick questions it's genuinely understanding like what you're like and also how you'll work with others and whether or not you'll you know you, you they you will fit in with the NHS organisation its values which you most likely will if you're interested in the scheme. I think that's great advice from both of you and I don't think I have anything to add other than that. Uh, Gabriel. Anna asks what is the time frame between stage two and stage three? Yeah so the First online assessment and the second online assessment take place between sort of now during the application window um, up until November. Um, and then the, the assessment centres take place in January. So that's the last assessment stage. Uh, if you're successful at the, the work based scenario stage, the second assessment stage, uh, you'll have the opportunity to book uh, an appropriate assessment centre for yourself during that that period. Um, so there's, there's lots of options. They run morning and afternoon, uh, but you'll be invited to, to you know, pick a date that's appropriate to you or you're able to do. Uh, Emily asks, I did the practice online assessment on the prep hub and did not receive any feedback. Am I supposed to be receiving feedback? So I think with the, the prep hub, um, I, I, you don't get in depth feedback because it's it's not the actual assessment. OK, it's it's purely um, a, a mock assessment to give you some um, experience of, of undertaking some of the questions and the mechanics of the questions so you can become familiar with that um, so it's not a surprise when you, when you take it for real but you know once you've taken the first assessment for real um, and the same with the second assessment and then again the same with the VAC you will receive a feedback report after each irrespective of whether you're successful or unsuccessful um, that just highlights some of the key strengths that you've demonstrated or, or some of the areas for development. Uh, Samson asks, is there any advice on how I can be more confident when I am making the videos in the prep hub? OK, Kiara, I don't know. I mean, you enjoyed the assessments, uh, so I don't know whether, you know, you're the right person to be asking. Um, but any advice on preparation for the videos? I mean, th there's no, uh, there's a time limit for the video, isn't there? But you get lots of time to prepare beforehand. Yeah, the video ones I think I found were an interesting one because you're obviously it's not a conversation. Um, so I think it can be, it's a different approach. I think 
yeah, take the time beforehand to think through what it is that you want to say. Um, I think imagine that you are speaking to someone. Don't think of it as a video where there's no one behind it. I think the best thing which helped me was imagine that there is a person there um, and think of it as a conversation, even though it's not. <laughs> I think that's good advice. I mean, there's no, um, you know, there's there's no time limit on the preparation. So as long as you've thought through what you want to say, you know, if you're imagining someone's there, you know, only press record when you're ready to do so. Okay, there's a time limit there purely because of the the amount of video that we're recording. Um, but as I said, there's there's no pressure beforehand, so no need to answer the question until you're ready. Uh, our next question is from Sakala, who asks, in terms of salary. Uh, I am on an NHS salary higher than the starting salary. How will my salary be calculated? Yeah, so um, if you are currently working within the NHS, um, then we are able to match salary. So if you're able to demonstrate continuous service, we are able to match your salary up to a maximum of 85% of the top band six. That's really important. So, you know, the salary that's currently offered for the majority of trainees is the £27,701. Um, at the end of the first year, that does rise slightly. There is an increase, uh, and that goes up to £29,800. And then for finance trainees who are still with us for that last half a year, it goes up again slightly. If you're joining us from the NHS and we've matched your salary up to the 85%, then that is the maximum. We aren't able to go any higher than that. So that will be the salary that you end up receiving for the entirety of the two years you're with us. Uh, Helen asks, what do you have to be when do you have to be available to start uh, if you are successful with the application process? Yes, yeah, so the scheme will start next September. I believe it's the second of September next year. Um, so you do, and that's we we run a large welcome event for two days uh, up in Leeds. That's when all of the trainees starting the cohort that year come together uh, for for two days of of training and sessions and onboarding sessions. Um, so you will need to be able to attend that. Okay, um, there's lots of communication between now and then throughout the assessment process. And then, of course, if you're successful with a place, then the onboarding process as well. Uh, Emily asks, can you choose which placements you take? So well, that, well, that's an interesting question. So ostensibly you can't. So they are organised before you start the scheme. But but Beth, your experience of that, I mean, when you started, I'm imagining you were placed in a team and there was a work stream that you were aligned to. Did you have any opportunity to flex that or to influence that at all? Oh yeah, completely. Um, I think that the vast majority of the time um, programme placement managers are really receptive to you expressing that you've got a special interest in something um, or you really want to work on something either within your um, programme of work or outside of it as well. The benefit of working in NHS England is that within one office or two offices. Um, there's people who work on completely different projects to you as well. And there's also, also a lot of opportunity for joint working, especially because now in the NHS, there's a huge emphasis on partnership working too. And that's both across different organisations and across different programmes of work. And um, so, for example, I was really interested in health inequalities and also kind of allyship and diversity within within the NHS. Um, so when I first joined, I was on a data project, but actually a lot of my work was, a, was within an allyship group that was kind of set up by um, my um, kind of mini um, team um, and kind of, you know, supported um, anti-racism education within our directorate as well. So I got to kind of just lead on that bit of work too. But what I'd also say about kind of choosing placements, I think that it's completely understandable that people would want to have a preference with their placements too. Um, but there's a really thorough kind of quality assurance check that goes through all the placements. So people bid or apply to have a trainee hosted within their own, within their organisation. Um, and there's a really thorough kind of checking process to make sure that the experience they, they give trainees and how much support they give them is really robust. And I was involved in some of the quality assurance for the trainees and their placements that have just come through on policy and strategy. Um, and I think it's actually really reassuring to know that the placements that you've been assigned to have gone through that robust and um, kind of checking mechanism as well and I think that's probably a better scenario than you know asking for a placement but maybe not having the level of support that that you would need um as well so that's what I would say in response to that lovely thank you Beth uh, Helen asks uh, a, a follow-up question to her last question um, and asks uh, is it all remote work or is some of it hybrid um, and is there a disability adjustment okay so um a combination answer for this really it does depend on the individual placement and the specialism um, and the host that you're with so we're really keen to offer adjustments to um, training start in the scheme uh, we have lots of different trainees who have all sorts of different uh, needs um, 
we are very interested in ensuring that you have every opportunity to be successful when, while you're with us. Um, depending on the specialism and the placement, there will be a different act access to remote working okay and that's just to be honest about that so for general management trainees for example being placed in an operational setting for your first placement um, for the vast majority of time you will need to be on site in your team in the trust that's because you're there in an operational environment for health informatics trainees for example that might be quite different so you may well be placed again in uh, an acute trust but the nature of the work that you're doing because it's much more analytical, um, it may well be there. there is the option for um, some, some remote working. There's clearly a value in being with your team and being connected with other people, um, but it is on an individual basis. So yes, there are adjustments available for trainees. I think it is very much considering the nature of the placement that you're in, the nature of the specialism that you're in uh, as to what will be possible. OK, but what I would say is I absolutely expect on the scheme to be on site, to be needing to go in to your office or to your host during your time with them at some point. OK, there's certainly no part of the scheme which is entirely remote. OK, um, and that, that goes the same for the education, the training components. So they are very much in person. Um, some parts are remote, um, you know, some of the lectures, some of the um, delivery, but there's a lot of it that is in person, either in London or in Leeds. Uh, so Carla has a question for Beth and Chiara. What is the most challenging part of the scheme? Yeah, all right, do you want to take, take that first? What have you found sure. most challenging this year? That's a very good question. Um, I think reflecting on the first year for me, one of the challenges that I had was setting expectations for myself. I think it obviously is a fast paced scheme. You have lots of commitments. There is a lot going on. Um, and I think for me, it was learning how I can best balance all of those different things. And I think understanding that people will have different ways of balancing it. Um, so I think that was one of the things I found when I started challenging, but I think definitely now, like it was such a great learning curve and reflecting on it. I feel more confident about going into future careers, having that experience. Um, but that was definitely a challenge, I think, for me, especially right at the start when joining. Betty, your ch most challenging part of the scheme for you? Yeah, kind of in addition to kind of the work life balance for studying, I think that's every trainee, including policy and strategy, I think that's probably a main one. But I think I'd also say that coming into the NHS graduate management training scheme, you're often joining teams who have worked in the NHS for a really long time and potentially in that very specific area for quite a long time. So I think the biggest challenge for me was, you know, not going into the panic of, oh, my goodness, I don't know anything. All these people are way more experienced than me. I feel like an idiot and um, to then realising that actually I will learn and I'll learn a lot, but also having a fresh pair of eyes and a fresh perspective can actually be really useful to the teams that you're going into, especially when you kind of have, you know, you've done other placements and you progress through the scheme. You say, oh, actually, I know this person in this team. It would make sense to join up or actually this is how we did things in this organisation when I was on my flexi placement or one of my even one of my fellow trainees, what they did in their organisation. Um, and that can be really useful. So understanding that one, you will learn and it will take time, but it will be a great learning curve. But don't uh, don't kind of undervalue yourself and what you, you'll be bringing into your teams too. Um, but, you know, it was a challenge to kind of then get to that point and, and have that kind of confidence. That's fantastic advice. Gabriel, next question. Uh, Teo asks, will the interview be tailored according to the specialism you applied for or is it just a general knowledge interview? So the, the interview is, it you know, it's not a, like a general knowledge test, but all all candidates, you know, all applicants to the scheme do go through the same assessment process. OK, so it isn't different uh, for different specialisms, um, you, you know, but there isn't, um, you know, you're not asked a series of questions to test your knowledge of the NHS, for example. You know, all the questions are designed to understand how you behave, how you think about various different things. Um, you know, it's certainly not a general knowledge quiz. Yeah. Uh, Evie asks, do you have anything in place for maternity or does it mean deferring? Um, I mean, I guess in essence we do. Um, I would think really just about timing. That's probably worth thinking about. I mean, the scheme um, does, 
you know, there are, I mean, life happens, I think, when trainees are on scheme, um, you know, and there can be huge changes in personal circumstances, and certainly the birth of a child is one of those. Um, you know, there is an opportunity to defer if you are on scheme currently. Um, I think it really depends if it's a consideration for you now, given that the scheme starts next September, it might be just worth thinking about that. Um, but I mean, certainly, you know, we have, um, uh, applicants to the scheme last year who were in a similar situation and discovered that they were expecting prior to starting the scheme or we were able to support them um, you know to in effect de de delay their start to the following year so they then are you know, going to be starting um, next year with us but but certainly do talk to us if there's if there's something that changes in terms of your circumstances. Uh, our next question is from Imogen, who asks, are there any downsides to selecting a, se a second choice? Um, in essence, there isn't, other than um, thinking really carefully about whether you would like to do that second choice. So um, I've referenced policy and strategy in general management. You know, many policy and strategy applicants would put general management or possibly HR as a second choice, but really only if they are a career path that you would like to develop. Um, and I say that because, you know, if you are very interested in the policy and strategy scheme and nothing else, then it doesn't really benefit you or indeed us to say you would like to do something else. If we call you to offer you a place on that second specialism choice and you don't really want to do that, then actually it doesn't benefit you really at all unless you actually want to accept that. I would highlight, though, once you've started the scheme, once you've accepted a role, in a particular specialism, you aren't able to change that during your experience. So do think really carefully about what you put. Um, you can change that right up until the point that we're offering you a role. Um, but certainly, if you aren't able to accept that specialism, where it's not something you want to do, then it, there really isn't any benefit to you. But if you do, then it may well mean that you get offered a place on the scheme on the reserve list if you're not uh, if you're not able to offer you the first choice specialism. Uh, Teo asks, does that mean you won't be asking for work references? I know we, so we do absolutely ask for work references, OK? Uh, they won't be required, though, unless we're able to make you an offer to join the scheme. So during the application process, you, you won't need to uh, indicate references. Um, you know, we're not going to be taking those. We will only need to do that at the point that we're offering you employment to join the GMTS. That's when we will require your work history and then we'll be taking references. And there are a number of other onboarding checks that need to take place. I think our last question is for Kiara and Beth. Um, what are some of the most interesting projects that you have worked on during your policy and strategy specialism? Hmm, good question. Uh, Kiara, do you want to say that first? Yeah, if, if we highlight the, the, the most interesting project that you have worked on in your time with the SAFER. Uh, yeah, another really great question. Um, I think I would have to say the long term workforce plan. I think just the amount of different opportunities um, doing data, research, stakeholders, really, really enjoyable. I think also the thing for me which I found really interesting about this particular project was it was had quite a strong political focus. Um, and I was really um, had some great opportunities. I managed to kind of be involved in meetings, observing discussions with the Treasury um, and things like that. And I think similar to a lot of policy and strategy trainees, um, I do have quite an interest in politics and that side of things as well. Um, so I re really enjoyed that. Mm, lovely. And, and Beth, your most interesting project while you were with the scheme? Yeah, I think the kind of the, the most interesting and probably where I felt the most impactful was in my last placement when I was working in nursing workforce policy. Um, but we had an opportunity to work with loads of different stakeholders, including Indeed and lots of charities to support refugees into NHS employment. Um, and that was just a, such a fantastic experience, kind of setting up events um, throughout the country and supporting refugee communities to attend and not just kind of supporting them into NHS jobs, but also upskilling them in terms of kind of um, um, literacy in terms of supporting their children into schools and community organisations and projects um, and I felt that you know there's no other organisation where you kind of have the opportunity to do something so impactful um, and kind of connect so much to, to different organisations and NHS organisations throughout the country so I really felt like I was I was making a difference um, in that project. 
That's wonderful. And I think that is a great place to end today's session. Uh, we've, over, we've we've gone on a lot with some absolutely fantastic questions. So thank you so much for asking those. We are going to draw today's session to a close, I think. I just want to highlight just a couple of things. So applications are currently open. The window will close uh, on the 31st of October. Uh, so it's important that if you are interested in applying, you do finish, your, you complete your application form by that point, OK? Uh, the start date for the scheme will be next September. It does say the 1st of September next year. It's, I think it, I believe it is in fact the 2nd of September next year. Um, do go and visit the Preparation Hub. It does give a lot of information about the assessments and will give you an opportunity to practice. Again, thank you so much for asking all the questions. Beth, uh, Kiara, thank you so much again for your time today. We really, really appreciate uh, you answering those questions and sharing your experiences. Uh, we hope we've given everyone attending today the information they needed about the scheme uh, and it's encouraged you to make an application if you feel that we're the right the right choice for you um, we are running other sessions so if you think of another question or would like to come uh, hear other trainees speak uh, then do look on the website there are other sessions being run up until the end of october thank you so much again for attending today um, we hope we see an application from you have a fantastic rest of the day and a western week thank you <laughs>